keep your water bottle with you. I'm not keeping your water. In recent years, we have heard a lot about Smart Nation. With the rapid growth of technology, there's actually many opportunities for us to improve our lives through tech-enabled solutions. This is not just happening in Singapore, but globally as well. By achieving Smart Nation, it's not an easy task. We need to be able to collect and analyse a large amount of data while keeping our hardware and software protected through robust cybersecurity efforts. As one of the top universities in the world, the School of Computer Science and Engineering has produced many students with the skills and expertise to contribute to Smart Nation and beyond. We get to utilise the best facilities and learn from the best professors who are not only outstanding researchers but also caring educators. At the same time, we have numerous opportunities for residential and student life activities which grows our networks and broadens our horizons. When we come into SCSC, we are exposed to both computer science and computer engineering by taking common courses in topics such as data analytics, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and digital media. We try to bring out the best quality of our students through the effort and strategies. We train our students to embrace and persist through challenges which lead them to a path of mastery. Students will have opportunity not just within NTU but abroad and beyond classroom. A large part of our curriculum actually focus on um, hands-on and projects. And it's also through uh, all these sessions and projects that students get exposed to industry-relevant platforms and processes. This gives us the broad knowledge of tackling multidisciplinary challenges of building a smart nation. In their course of studies, students are able to hone their skill in technical areas of using equipment such as digital oscilloscope, arbitrary function generator, multimeters, and many more uh, equipment that is available in the laboratory. In the software, the students are taught to do high-level programming, low-level exposure programming, and even artificial intelligence. All our labs are maintained and updated to ensure the students have a seamless experience. It's my privilege actually um, to take groups of students overseas every year and to compete with other students from top universities overseas. It's also an opportunity for the students to network with other people. Thus, I see the Students Cluster Competition as an amazing platform for students to learn and compete in a friendly manner technically and innovatively. This undergraduate program gives you the opportunity to get into data science and AI before everyone does. You don't have to do a computer science or engineering major and then specialize in this. You get into the specialization right away. I did my internship with CSID during my summer holidays working on a cybersecurity project and an analytics project. This project has allowed me to leverage on my skill set gained from my business and computer science curriculum. I'm currently an intern at DSO working on a deep learning research project. During my time at NTU, I had the chance to take up the UPA program, which allowed me to further my passion for artificial intelligence. As a UI UX intern at GovTech, I am given the opportunity to work on citizen centric projects. I'll be going for my professional internship at China Beijing for about six months. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to see how things work in an overseas environment and I'm looking forward to all the different IT projects that I'll be taking part in. The school equips me with the skills and knowledge to share in the exciting vision of building a smart nation. From empowering the elderly to building vehicles for the future, there are so many opportunities out there. Today, our seniors can be found in almost any industry, anywhere in the world. Many have even become technopreneurs. The past years in NTU SCRC have been some of the best years in my life, and I'm glad I chose this school. But at the same time, I look forward to graduating and beginning my career in the industry. 
A degree from the School of Computer Science and Engineering is not just my passport to the world, but my passport to the future. And I'm really excited to see what's in store for me. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Open House 2021 from the School of Computer Science and Engineering, College of Engineering, Nanyan Technological University, Singapore. I wish we had the opportunity of inviting you to our campus this time and have this interaction in person. That would definitely be better. But again, I think this digital version of the event offers us an unlimited reach to all of you sitting at your homes, your workplaces, or even in a different country. So if you think that you want to join this event, if you're interested in SCSC, NTU, do log in. Do check our Slido page. Go ahead and post questions there. This is a panel for the faculty discussion. We'll have six faculty members on the panel, including myself. My name is Shourav. I am the assistant chair for outreach and admissions at the school. And I will be the moderator for this panel. It's my pleasure to welcome on board five lovely panelists from the school who will try to answer all your questions. Please post your questions. We're going to take questions from you. And we are also going to ask some burning questions that you have already asked us earlier. Join this. If you haven't seen your friends joining this, if you know they're waiting to hear from us, please share this live event with them. We are on FB Live. We are on YouTube Live as well. All right. Without further ado, let's begin the panel discussion. Let me welcome my panel of distinguished faculty members from the School of Computer Science and Engineering. Thank you all for being here with us today. May we quickly go with a round of introductions, please? Maybe Safran. Hello, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, I'm uh, Aishin from the School of Computer Science and Engineering, uh, College of Engineering. I'm the assistant chair academic helping uh, Prof Nick on the various uh, academic matters. So in this uh, critical time, we're helping in the admission and scholarship interview. So later, if you have any questions regarding admission criteria as well as scholarship, all right, please write to, uh, to us and ask through the slider. Thank you. Hello, Kelly. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kelly, an associate professor at the school. Um, my research is mainly in uh, data mining and artificial intelligence, focusing on graph learning, graph analytics, and graph mining. Uh, I teach course uh, such as uh, algorithms, algorithm design, and analysis in the school. Thank you. Prof. Nick. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicholas. So I'm the associate chair for the academics in the School of Computer Science and Engineering. So basically, I'm in charge of uh, academic affairs in the school, including you know, the admissions. So I have a great team here to help me today. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Li Fang. Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Li Fang. In this semester, I'm lecturing CECZ1103, Introduction to Computational Thinking and Programming, and CECZ2002, Object-Oriented Design and Programming. Besides the teaching duty, I'm the final year project coordinator in this school. Thank you. Thank you. Hong Lai. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Hong Lai. I'm handling most of the uh, computer engineering related courses in the school. Um, things like uh, microprocessor systems, uh, computer architecture, etc. And I'm also the assistant chair for student care. And our team basically handles the student well-being um, from the point before you actually come into the school up to the point where you graduate, and actually after you graduate as well. So, thank you. Thank you. 
All right, so you know you have got areas covered in all respects, from student care to admissions, scholarships. So post us any questions that you want. Post us on Slido, and we'll shortlist your questions, and we'll start asking them to the panel. All right, uh, maybe before we get the questions from Slido, we start with some questions that we always get. Uh, Profik, we always get the question about our degree programs that we offer. So I know that there are plenty in offer. Can you clarify what, which is which? Sure. I will go through the programs that is offered by our school uh, currently. So to start with, our school is basically uh, you know, focusing on computer engineering and computer science primarily. So we have the Bachelor of Engineering in Computer Science and Computer Engineering. But since then, we also have uh, introduced quite a lot of other programs as you can see on the screen. So for example, we have our Bachelor of Science in Data Science and AI, which is a very popular program and very in-demand program. And uh, we have our double degree programs in uh, Bachelor of Computing, right, together with the Nanyang Business School that specialize in, uh, in the business analytics. But very excitingly, we are actually introducing two new programs this year. So one is the double degree in accountancy with our data science and AI. Right, so this will allow those who are very strong in accountancy to also learn how to apply data science and AI in the field of accountancy. Right. The other program, new program that we're introducing is our double major program, which is an interdisciplinary program between economics and data science. So this is an interdisciplinary program and uh, this is for those who are strong in economics and uh, want to know how to use, make use of data science to learn about you know, the big data of, uh, that we've encountered in economics. Right? So apart from that, we also have the double major in uh, business, for example, for those of you who uh, you know, may, may want to learn about business, but probably uh, might not want to uh, spend too much time with the double degree programs. So these are the, our double majors. So we also have another double degree programs in computing together with uh, uh, economics. Right? So this is a five-year degree program. So I guess this is uh, most of the major programs. Did I cover everything? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think that's okay. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pravik. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, well, there's this funky pizza motto out there. We refer to it as how many courses and how much load you're going to take in each of these programs. All right? So just go by the ballpark of that. So it's almost like you're taking about half and half in a double major. You are taking slightly more, of course, in a double degree. Uh, Profik, may I just continue with that? So for double degrees, we have four years, 4.5, also five. That's right. So why this difference? Why four and five? Good question. So for our double degree program in uh, computing with the business is a four years programs, right? So the reason that it can be four years is because in the study of the business analytics in the business, there are actually quite a few common courses that we can sort of uh, cross share between the computing and the business. So when you take one of these course, it can count towards the other degree. So with that, we have actually uh, meticulously you know, designed the curriculum such that you will be able to complete the programs in four years. Right. So for the business of, uh, uh, so sorry, not the business, so the double degree in accountancy and computing, so this is a 4.5 years uh, program, right? because the accountancy is three years, while our computing, uh, the data science and AI is four years. So because there is not so much overlap, so we have to sort of design our curriculum in such a way that we don't want to compromise in the you know, quality of the, the program itself. So we need to stretch it by uh, half a year for this uh, accountancy and uh, data science AI. Uh, the other double degree program that we have is the economics with our computing. So there are not so much uh, sort of uh, overlap between the two. So for that degree, the double degree, we actually have to do in five years. Understood, yeah, that makes sense, all right. Uh, okay, so if you are more interested in knowing about all these programs in detail, Prof. Nick has also very kindly put up a really nice video explaining all of these in details. It will be out in our social media platforms next week. Keep an eye for it. All right, so um, 
Coming back from the programs, we have a lot, but we also hear the students are quite keen on getting scholarships to come on board. So maybe Prof Sun, if I ask you, how about the scholarships that are in offer? What is RET, CNY? Okay, great. Um, um, you guys are lucky. And we have a plenty, plenty of scholarships, right? Uh, as uh, Saurabh mentioned, we have the uh, REP, CNY, uh, CNYL scholarship, as well as the USP scholarship. So um, we also have uh, scholarships from the government agencies as, as, as well as the industry scholarships, right? So the REP, CNYL, and USP, they are university level programs. So the scholarships for these programs are handled by their dedicated office, right? So they have their own, um, pr uh, own procedure to uh, interview and select. So basically, the CNY is prepare the students more for research, and the USP is prepare the students more for the um, interdisciplinary study and build the leadership, right? So for them, they have their own modules to cover in their, uh, at the core subjects, as well as a base program you can choose from. So the base program, for example, the computer science program from school or computer engineering uh, program from school, right? Then in the year one, you will have some common modules, and year two until year four, you'll be more uh, specialized in the base program. Um, so these are not directly managed by uh, all school, but on the other hand, there are also Nanyang scholarships, college scholarships, and school scholarships, which is applicable to all the different programs. That also means that it's applicable to all the programs offered by all school, right? So if you want to apply for Nanyang scholarship, uh, college scholarship, and school scholarship, do indicate your interest in your application, and then um, if you are shortlisted, we'll go follow up with the interview, okay? Right, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So is interviews very common for scholarships, or do we do it on a case-to-case -case basis? Uh, yes, interview is um, applicable to all the scholarship uh, applicants, right, uh, provided if they are shortlisted, okay? <laughs> um, maybe i just add on one more thing, is that like now scholarship, college scholarship, and school scholarship, uh, of course, their benefits are tiered. Uh, so the now scholarship is the most premium scholarship uh, you know, uh, in NTU, right? And the um, best thing is that they will handle all the tuition fees, all right? And um, it's bound free. Is that uh, for other scholarships in the like government agencies or industry, they might have come with a bound. But for now, scholarship, college, and school scholarship is bound free, all right? So this is one of the uh, things you need to consider. So when you come to the interview, we look at the leadership, all right? We look at the communication skills and we look at the passion. So eventually, the scholarship will be awarded to the scholars and we wish to become the leader in the future. Okay? Understood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prasun. So that, that was all about how you get in, what are the courses, how do you choose scholarships and all. Let's, let's come into, when you come into SCSC, what do you face there? So maybe I start with Kelly in this case. Uh, you have been teaching CS courses for a long time now. What do we offer the students? A lot of theory, or do they also have hands-on? How does it go, the courses? Um, for the design of the curriculum for a CS program, uh, we consider both. Um, so we have uh, covered uh, a number of fundamental courses, such as the, uh, the algorithms, the sum math course, discrete math, linear math, uh, linear algebra, and also um, algorithm design and analysis. Um, then we also cover a number of more advanced topics that is more uh, application oriented. For example, the uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, computer, uh, computer security, et cetera. So we, we feel that um, uh, students should be equipped with both uh, theoretical uh, uh, knowledge and as well as the, uh, the application uh, experience. So in our curriculum, we have both uh, elements. Right, that makes sense. So you said your research interests are more in graph mining and data mining in general. Would you encourage students to learn more about the theory of the topic or do hands-on programming more often? How does it go? Um, for, for graph mining research, certainly we need some theoretical foundation uh, in order to, for example, to, um, to ensure the correctness of uh, the proposed algorithm, 
and also to um, to analyze its time, space, complexity, uh, and to understand it, its uh, theoretical performance. Uh, we also look at some uh, hands-on uh, hands projects in some of the courses, for example, algorithms. We design some um, projects for the students to work on real, uh, real data, uh, large scale one, and then to let them have some experience on how to handle these kind of practical problems. Uh, using the theoretical knowledge they have uh, mastered from the course. Right, great. Thanks a lot. That that I hope that helps the students a lot in understanding. So on the flip side of the story, maybe I come to Hong Lai in this case. We also offer a lot of core computer engineering programs. So more on the hardware side, I believe. How does it go? Is it also a lot of theory, or it's just more hardware and programming? Okay, um, there is this misconception that hardware is just dealing with hardware, but uh, basically where computing is concerned, hardware um, involves a lot of programming as well. It's just at a different level, different type of language that is involved, but the construct, the computational thinking um, concept behind is actually actually the same as the um, the software side. Right. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of hands-on. <laughs> of course. What would you say is the main difference when a student chooses say computer science versus engineering. How would you um, recommend them to choose? Okay, um, for that probably they need to understand what is the difference between CS and CE programs, which is probably one of the most uh, popular questions from students. Okay, um, both are computing um, program, so basically means that we need to impart to the students um, some basic foundation computing knowledge, um, which is why um, the first year for CS and CE, they are actually common. So they take exactly the same subject, same module. And um, after that, from second onwards, you start to see some divergence. CE side, um, they will deal more with a little more hardware um, in the um, context of microprocessor systems and sensors. So these are the two uh, key um, hardware modules where computer systems are involved. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Hong Lai. That's good. So as we gather mostly from the panel so far, CSCE to different programs, there's of course theory, but there's a lot of hands-on. So it's, again, another burning question. Li Fang, I'll come to you, because you teach the programming mod in the first semester. Is it all right for a student to apply to CSCE if they don't have any programming background? Will they be comfortable? Definitely, the student without programming background can actually get, the, get in, because our school accepts applicants without programming background. So. Uh, we teach the programming courses start from scratch because we do assume the student do not know programming. So definitely you can survive and excel. <laughs> um, so programming is not hard, especially in SCSE. So first we teach programming from scratch. Secondly, we try to make programming subject engaging. Mm. Tick CEC Z1103, Introduction to Computational Thinking and the Programming as Example. Student programs on API and visualize the program execution on SenseCat. You know that? It's really interesting. So we make this journey interesting and make the Python programming not boring at all, not hard at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lifa. I think just to continue from that, magically, we have a video to show you how that goes. So let's quickly check that. So first we learn how to display text on the Raspberry Pi, as shown here. Then we learn how to display images using different RGB values. And then we learn how to use an accelerometer to change the direction of the dot. Then from there, we manage to implement a game by moving the dot through a maze. Yay! <laughs> so I stole this line from Li Fang. Computational thinking is definitely more important than programming at times. All right? So Li Fang would teach you that course 1103 as you come in, first year, first semester. And then I teach a course on data science and AI right after, first year, second semester. They don't require you to know programming beforehand. Come in, we'll teach you from scratch. All right. So um, moving on from courses, I think another set of questions which are really important for the students. Maybe Prof Nick, I'll start with you. 
a lot of students ask us, how about the work study degree program? Um, how do we go about it, or do all the students get a chance? How is it? Okay, there's a very good questions. Uh, the work study degree program currently in our school is applicable for the data science and AI programs. So basically, in this W uh, work study degree program, which we call WSDP, so students will do multiple internship during the uh, course of the program. So for example, after the second year, right, during our uh, what we call the summer break, summer holiday, so the student will do a three months internship with the company, right? So after that, they will uh, do uh, another internship, three months internship with the company during the next uh, summer break. And when they are doing the six month internship, they, are, they will be expected to uh, also do the internship with the company. So instead of just studying, right, they actually do multiple internship. And uh, when they are doing the final year project, the final year project will also be, you know, uh, it is a project that will be uh, related to the company that they are attached to. So basically, uh, with this uh, uh, work study degree program, so the internship that they are, the extra internship that they are doing will be counts towards the credit. And so they will take less courses, uh, usually it's those uh, broadening, this uh, elective type of courses, right, in view of this uh, uh, intern internship, multiple internship. Yes, so how do we select the student? So currently what we do is like this. We actually ask the student to identify the company that they are interested in. So they will then write into the company Right, to, to sort of uh, submit the CV and explain why they want to work with the company. So the company typically will also interview the student. And then if both sides sort of uh, agree with each other, then you know, things move out right. move along. Yeah. That's, that's very nice. Right. Yeah. Mm. So it makes sense that so the work study degree program encompasses a lot of industry interaction already as a part mm. of the course. I think the students, for you, those who are watching now, if you have more questions about it, you may also look at the Reddit Ask Me Anything channels. From the DACI batch, there should be one. Ask them about it and about their experience. They'll be able to tell you, all right? And there's also a student's panel in the afternoon today. You can throw the questions to them as well. So given the work study degree program is for the DACI as of now, and then how about the others? Maybe, Honglai, if I may ask you, you have got an extensive industry experience. So, how does industry perceive SCSC degree programs? What are they looking at in a student? Okay, um, basically for, when industries look at, um, let's say job applicants, um, what we typically look at is not, not just the name of the degree, but uh, really what is the student's experience. And uh, the experience could come from internship, it could come from projects that they do through FYPs or some other um, projects that they are involved in. So these are the things that we look out for and uh, drill in when uh, we so-called interview with the job applicants. And uh, which brings me to the point where um, the importance of the internship. Okay, our school actually um, has a core curriculum, um, internship built into the core curriculum, a 20 weeks internship. And you may think that, well, 20 weeks, that's a long time. But uh, if you think about it and from the experience we have, 20 weeks is just about the time that the company needs to first train the students and give them a meaningful project that is of beneficial to the company and the student as well. Okay, I mean, uh, we, we, we have to entice the company as well in, in terms of um, giving them internship uh, students. So, um, yeah, that is, uh, and, and that what I mentioned just now, um, internship experience is going to go in um, go a long way for the students when they do the job applications. Right. So, for these internships, I understand that 20 week is a professional internship. That's a mandatory thing. Apart from that, do you see students also doing other internships during the four years? Yes, actually, um, it is kind of like an increasing trend that students would um, do internship. <coughs> Excuse me. That um, they will self-source their internship during the, um, the term breaks. Um, some even take LOA to actually go for um, a long-term internship. Right. Um, because they know that um, this is what will get them the edge um, subsequently in their career. Right, absolutely. I have actually known students who have taken an LOA to start up a company. And then that serves not just internship, but entrepreneurial zeal as well. So that's, that's quite fun. Um, so Prof Soon, may I ask you, you, you work in data science and AI, specifically natural language processing quite a lot. So 
Um, how about DSAI? Is it more in demand now, as it seems? How about our CS and CE students? Can they specialize? Okay, so DSAI, of course, is in a good demand from the industry, right? And nowadays, we see more and more apps developed by, let's see, the government agencies, right, to fighting the COVID-19 and so on and so forth. We also see the daily life change because of the various different apps that has been developed in different uh, perspectives. And we also are starting to receive more and more requests from the industry players and to uh, kind of uh, consult us on how to good use of their data. And they have realized that the importance of data, right? And want to uh, utilize the data and to improve uh, their uh, production or improve the customer service and uh, all the other perspectives. Um, but on the other hand, I will see for computer science and computer engineering program provide a broader coverage of the topics, okay? And all of them, or both of them, can be specialized into uh, data science and AI uh, when you come to the third year and fourth year, all right? So in this case, you, you, you learn about topics like graphics, networking, and so on and so forth. And then if you are interested to go for data science and AI, you still be able to pick up the uh, courses and specialize in the final year. Right. So, Prasun, I'll just take a Slido question which came in right now. It says, since there are so many students graduating with a computer-related degree every year from the local unis, is it possible to secure a job right after graduating? Um, no one can see the future. But on the other hand, we see there's a great demand in this uh, direction. All right. So, um, as I mentioned just now, why we receive requests from the industry, um, that's because they do, not, they do not have the right professionals to work on the problem. That's why the first thing they can think of is to ask the professors in the university in the right discipline. All right? They even do not know who to ask from. All right? So uh, that does reflect a, a kind of a good demands, uh, at least at this stage. All right? So in future, uh, I believe um, because we all take the students according to a kind of intake plan that uh, from MOE, so the government actually have a good plan on which area there's a, there's a demand in the in the uh, talent, and then they will adjust the intake accordingly. Right. I think on the slide or on the video right now, as you see, is probably this year's right. It just came out today. Yes. The employment rates. So you see, still it's quite in demand, and you can see which areas are in demand. So you can plan accordingly. All right. Okay. Um, we talked a lot about internships, work study degree programs, and all those things. But there is another component that I know. Li Fang, you are in charge. Final year project. How does it go? What do the students do? Final year project is um, one important part in our curriculum. And we can see that it's one of the major projects. So the final year student, each final year student, will be supervised by one of the academic staffs to work on the project individually. Then the student who have registered for FIP will be given one year to complete the project. So the student will practice and develop their self-initiative, creativity, and the design ability using the knowledge they have learned in this program over the years. Um, Thank you. Okay. So I see there are lots of areas which you can do it in, right? Yes, uh, we do have the wide um, selection. So you can see that as for the research fields, we have about 66. Then some students might see that, oh, I'm not interested in research. Then how can I do? No worries. We have 50% of the proposals are application-based means that development and implementation. So every student can get a suitable project, no worries. 100% of the student can get their preferred project. 90% of them can get their top three choices. Wow, that's, that's Thank you. quite nice. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lifa. All right, and of course, some of you have talked to your seniors who are already here, and you might have heard about something known as MDP or as Smitha, the coordinator, calls it, the must-do project. Let's take a quick look. 
I am the coordinator for this MDP course, which consists of both computer science and computer engineering students. This system integration course, which students coming from different backgrounds working on this as a group, each group would contain eight members. Uh, we have a mobile robotic challenge. Basically, we provide students with a maze. So the robot has to navigate through the maze, find out all the obstacles. And then once they have done this, they have to go from the start position to the goal position in the fastest possible. The school structured this course in such a way that they are encouraged a healthy competition among the different project teams by weekly competition at the end of every Friday. It's like the maze runner. That is the first real problem that we are trying to solve by applying what we have learned. And we can see the joy and the disappointment in the students and this kind of gives us a sense that they are being engaged in their learning. Students realise that even though they have finished their projects, there are other teams that have done better than them. This actually provides that kind of real-life scenarios for our students where, you know, if you go out to work, every time uh, you think you are good enough, somebody else come up with something better. So it's very useful sometimes to make students work in close proximity because that they really learn from each other. Shorter path, three, two, one, go! All right, again, from Smitha, the coordinator, I think also the students realize that very, very soon that learning to learn and to adapt is way more important at times. So that's something that this MDP throws you into. It's a challenge. You do it. If you do it well, you gain a huge experience and accolades. Even if you do not do it very well, still you get a huge amount of experience on troubleshooting, problem solving, and of course, soft skills. Maybe on that note, I'm just curious. So this FYP or all the other courses, maybe it's open for the panel, anyone. Um, how important are soft skills in addition to all these things that we are teaching them? Do we promote that? Who wants to take a turn? Very yeah, public. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe I can just uh, speak a little bit about it. Yes, I think the soft skill in today's society is a very Im important, right? So apart from knowing having the knowledge, you also need to know how to work with other people. Right? Because in real life, when you go out to work, you are not going to work alone. You have to uh, collaborate with other people. So you need to know how to uh, present your idea, present your arguments right, to this. So actually in our projects, uh, many times we actually have a team-based project where the students need to work together. Right? They need to know how to actually contribute and uh, more importantly, how to actually Know, work nicely with each other. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> because this is a very important skill in real life. You know? In real life, you don't work alone. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I know there are lots of projects with courses. I wish to pick Kelly, maybe. I think all of our courses have some project. How do you handle the projects in your course? And what do the students do? Uh, yeah, for most of our courses, actually, we have the hands on, um, so hands on practice. So typically, we design the projects to be more clo uh, to be closer to the uh, real life problem, and then we also try to make it um, open ended so that students can explore different alternatives, uh, different solutions in order to tackle the same problem, and that would be really interesting. Right, I think Prof Sun, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just to uh, add on this because I just released the assignment yesterday. <laughs> All right, so. Um, during the, uh, also I take one day to prepare that as well. Um, so I teach natural language processing. And uh, uh, so the projects we have or the assignments for the course, right, is taken from the real data. So in this case, we take a data set that is released by a website, uh, basically the customer review data, right? So we design the questions based on the real data provided by the real uh, industry player. And we apply some interesting um, kind of a task ask the students to, uh, to work on it. And there's no uh, standard or perfect solutions, but there are better solutions. True, true. I, I, I cannot agree more. So uh, from my own experience for the course that I teach for DSCI, Introduction to Data Science, um, I sometimes don't even give a problem. Like what you say, it's an assignment, so you give a problem. For my projects, I ask them to find their own problem. And they come up with amazing real-life data sets and problems on that. It's really, really good that way. 
how does the hardware projects run? How do you make sure they are getting something which is industry relevant? Hong Lai, definitely. Okay. Um, I was on the industry. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, one of my key jobs um, back in industries is actually as a workshop instructor. So what I did for the microprocessor system is actually to port the um, entire four-day workshops, the full four-day workshops to their labs. So their labs actually got uh, sort of um, put on steroids. And um, yeah, they, they had to go through all the things that uh, we went through, all the real industries, um, engineers go through um, for, the, for that particular module. So there's a lot of hands-on, um, and the labs actually occupies like 50% of the assessment. Wow, yeah. that's, that's a lot, right? Oh, I, I understand, because all of our faculty members have some ties with industry. We work on industry projects, we talk to industry research labs. So is there anyone else who, who includes something from industry connections into their courses? Do you, maybe, Kelly, do you do that from your research, some things that you ask the students to do? Um, we, we do have some in, uh, industry collaborators and industry projects, but I think so far I haven't actually included in them into the course. Instead, we offer some uh, undergraduate internships uh, for the students to carry out the, uh, the, uh, some uh, actual or practical research uh, in collaboration with the industry partners. So in one of my projects, actually, we have a uh, collaboration with uh, Rolls-Royce, a leading uh, power, power system provider in the, uh, in the world. So we basically work on some problems on uh, the fluid data um, analysis. Um, so it's not very um, kind of well known, but um, we basically model it as a graph problem, and then we uh, try to develop new methods on uh, analyzing this kind of data automatically. Uh, we, we did recruit uh, student interns uh, so that the students can, uh, it can um, go through the entire research process, including uh, formulating the practical problem and then uh, conduct some uh, literature review, and then actually uh, uh, design or uh, apply appropriate methods on the problem, and then conduct the experimental results, an uh, experimental study in order to come up with some nice conclusion. Great, all right, so they do actually see a lot of research and industry collaborations come into their work. Is it the same for the final year projects, we found? Yes, so we have a few kinds of uh, final year project. Among them, it, one is JIP, Joint Industry Project. The purpose of JIP actually is to provide the chance to the student to practice their knowledge they have learned to solve the problem, the real practical problems. So that's, um, as for the JIP is only project the fine only FIP project can be self-sourced. So actually we do provide the opportunity to students to work in the real world context. Thank right. you. Makes sense. So on the flip side of it, I just got a Slido question. I must ask, I don't know, anyone can take it up. So apart from programming, do I need to know a lot of math to survive in SCSC? How much math is there in the courses? Prof. Sun, <laughs> or Prof. Nick? Um, okay, uh, this probably is reflected from the uh, admission criteria, right? So the admission criteria is uh, listed in, in the uh, admission office website. So you may notice that for all the programs uh, under our school, the first requirement is that you have a pass in X2 mathematics. Then the second requirement is that you have a pass in other subjects like biology, chemistry, computing and so on and so forth, right? So the mathematics H2 is the key requirement. And that also means that we do need uh, kind of uh, mathematics Somewhere. as the background. Uh, because if you look at programming, right? Programming is not simply just translate the things you want the computer to do. And many of the programmings have a strong mathematical foundation behind. And why we need to do this in this way and because there is a time complexity, there is a space complexity you need to consider. And many of this requires uh, proofs from the mathematics um, 
so that we, are, we know that this program is guaranteed uh, to be the optimal or um, some kind, other kind of guarantees, all right? So it is not uh, every time is like try and error and see it does not work and they modify. There is a strong mathematical model behind and that's why we consider that we do need a kind of a mathematical uh, background. So it's also a good um, way to spend your time before you come to the university in August, right, to brush up your mathematics. Right. Perfect. Yeah, maybe I can just add to that. You know? So if you uh, have a look at the curriculums of our programs, you'll find that we actually have uh, four mathematics course in the first year and second year, right? So yes, we do need uh, you to have uh, a mathematics background, but uh, we also make sure that you, know, you have a solid mathematics background when you come to our program. So you will learn things like uh, linear algebra, calculus, probability and statistics, discrete maths. You know? So these are the courses that you will take in uh, year one, right? and uh, I think the other one is in year two. So this will form the foundation for the computing uh, study in our school, actually. Yes. Right. So, Prof. Dick, may I continue with you? Because there's a spider question which asks that if I have prior experience in computing, robotics, and other things, how much can I skip? Can I skip a few courses? Can I get exempted? Okay. Uh, currently, we actually uh, allow the student to uh, you know, skip uh, the CZ1103 that uh, Dr. Lee Fangs are teaching. If they feel that they can, uh, they, they, they already know, know, know the background of this programming. But what we do now is actually, we actually let the student sit through uh, some sort of quiz, right? If they can pass it, right? Then they can actually skip one of these uh, mathematics course. Uh, sorry, not the mathematics course, the programming course. The, the introduction to computational thinking and programming. So that is the only one that we uh, allow the student to skip. If they have the programming background. Because uh, although you might feel that you already know about programming, but program, uh, the study of computing is not about programming. Programming is just the last part of the computing, which means you implement your idea, right? So what is important is to be able to design a good software rather than just say, I know how to implement it. So, so it, it's more than just programming. So although you know programming, but what we are teaching you is not about programming. We are teaching you software engineering, how to design good software, right? So there's the difference. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. So that that's really great that we have a mix of different things and they can choose from that bouquet. But amidst all this programming theory and everything, maybe I can ask Hong Lai, student care. How do we support the students who need help, or if they need support going through? Do the other students support them? Do we have some other mentorship? Okay. Um, like what I mentioned just now. The, we actually take care of our students right even before they come into the school. Okay, they will put through some orientation programs and which will meet their seniors and their peers. And this actually forms a very good network for them in, in, you know, in sort of knowing how their school actually works. And upon coming into the school, they will actually be assigned a mentor, which is also one of the teaching faculties in our school. And the mentor will actually follow them throughout their entire program. So to provide guidance and support as and when they is required. And subsequently, let's say they encounter some issues with some of the modules. Okay, um, for more certain modules, we do actually have um, what we call the um, student tutor, um, tutoring group, where we actually get students to, um, who actually performs uh, very well in the particular module to actually teach the peers. And on top of that, um, if let's say the student wanted a one-to-one -one peer tutoring, it is also possible, and that can be arranged as well. Understood. So yeah, I agree with that, that we actually take care of you even before you join. And I just got a slido question I should mention. There is a special term where we offer you courses even before you join to prepare. So I just got a question, maybe Prof. Nick, Prof. Sun, one of you. Um, what would you recommend for returning NS freshmen? Should they join the special term? Should they take those preparatory courses? Which modules? I think for the retaining assessment, there is a um, uh, refresh course on mathematics, right? So we do encourage all the uh, retaining AS students to join that course uh, to be getting prepared for the first year courses. So is there some specific courses that you would recommend or generally math and programming brush up is all right? Well, 
I believe for all, all rich team actually have an arrangement for that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we do provide, and it's generally your seniors who actually design a lot of these courses and also offer you their advice and feedback. In terms of what they faced when they joined, they were in your situation a year or two years back. So talk to them, find out what are the courses in offer and what they suggest you. All right, so that's a very good starting point. Okay, um, there is a different question. It's kind of the load, I guess. Maybe Prof Nick, if I can ask you. Somebody asked a prospective student interested in business and computing, but they are a little confused about whether they should go with a double degree or a double major. What would be the difference? Okay, so basically, uh, uh, first I, let, let me talk about the double degree. So double degrees means that you actually get two degree at the end, right? So you actually uh, study two programs. So <coughs> you will get uh, a Bachelor of Engineering in, for example, Computer Science. And then you also get the Bachelor of, uh, I think it's Bachelor of Business in uh, Business Analytics from uh, Nanyang Business School. So you actually study two programs, right? So this is really for those who are very, very keen on really you know, uh, learn about the, the intricacy of both programs. But we also realize that you, know, you have to realize that if it's double degree program, the workload is quite heavy, right? So students who are interested in business, but they feel that maybe they also want to uh, spend some other times on some other things, right? So this uh, uh, the second major in business basically allow the student to actually study the business aspect of uh, how, how to use computing for business. But the weight, the weightage for the business is about 25% of the, 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 this uh, second major, while in the double degree program, you actually get 50-50, compared to, for example, 75 against 25%. Yeah. So I there's understand. a difference. Yeah. Understood. So the load will be different, and they should choose carefully accordingly. That's right, yeah. Makes yeah. sense. All right, so uh, Li Fang, may I ask you, for the final year project, does it apply in the same way for a double degree student also? How does a double degree student take an FYP from our school or from other schools? Um, they choose the project from the same pool, both CE and CS student. Then as for the double uh, degree student, they also select the proposal from the common pool. The pool is proposed by our academic staffs. Understood. Okay, makes sense. So um, those who are interested in the other areas like economics or accountancy or business, so for those who are already in DS and AI, would you recommend them to go for data science AI but applied in those areas? Or do you think there is enough weightage already on DS AI as a subject? What would you suggest? <laughs> Kelly, do you want to take it? Um, for the program itself, for the cur curriculum, we in, we indeed cover some of the uh, some more application oriented courses. But if the students have spare time, for example, during the term break or uh, in, in in summer vacation, they could also choose to participate in, uh, for example, the industry project internship. Uh, we also have the Eureka, uh, the undergraduate uh, research uh, experience on campus. Uh, we have. Uh, collaborated with a number of institutes in ASTAR and also some industry partners. Uh, our academic faculty members can also propose uh, some research-oriented uh, projects for the students to work on the uh, re more research-oriented project. Okay, so yes, Prof. Nick. Yes, uh, actually, there's another way that the student can explore other disciplines apart from, for example, computer science or data science. In uh, NTU, we have this um, you know, elective, right, which we call, uh, we used to call it the free unrestricted elective, but now we have, uh, for next year onwards, or for, for, ne for, for this new cohort uh, admission years onward, this is called the broadening and deepening elective. So students who want to learn something that is outside of the, the domain, like for example, as you say, you want to uh, learn about how do you apply data science to economics, you can actually use this deep, uh, elective to actually take out some courses that is related to economics, for example. I think there are, in NTU, we have a lot of minors that are in a different uh, domain, different discipline. So those of you in, uh, for example, data science, AI, if you want to learn, see, uh, learn how to apply in economics, probably you can take out a minor in uh, 
area that is uh, related to economics, offered by the uh, School of Social Science, for specifically for, for uh, economics as an example. Okay. Yeah. So students who are not doing second major, not doing double degree, you still have a chance to actually do a minor in a different discipline in NTU. Uh, there are plenty of this. Yeah. And you were adding something, I guess. That uh, many of our um, faculty members in the school, uh, they have uh, interdisciplinary uh, research projects. So we have uh, research projects, for example, in financial domain, like uh, those projects inside uh, the We Bank uh, Joint Center. We also have some, like uh, uh, I have mentioned earlier, some projects in the field of uh, fluid dynamics with Rolls Royce, and then also uh, projects on computer vision on um, in the sense time joint lab. So uh, by nature, all these projects are interdisciplinary, and by participating in this kind of projects, students can also learn the knowledge, the background knowledge uh, in another domain, in addition to the CS and CZ, uh, CE um, uh, knowledge. Right. That, that makes a lot of sense, because you can always do other things, and all of our faculty members have interdisciplinary interests, as far as I know. Prof. Nick, of course. Yeah, uh, maybe I just, uh, to. Uh, I have one more point uh, from uh, Kathy's answer. Uh, Kathy mentioned about the Eureka, the undergraduate research experience on campus, right? So for Eureka, students once get invited, it's by invitation, uh, by the way. So once the students are get invited for to do a Eureka project, they can choose surprises across entire NTU. It's not restricted to our school, right? So if you're interested in uh, projects on social science or projects on economics or other discipline, um, you can look for the uh, projects and surprises from other schools. Yes, absolutely. So uh, from my personal experience, I, um, I specialize in security, cryptography, and things like that. So I work a lot in privacy nowadays. And I also like machine learning, and I teach data science. So Eureka students with me have worked on privacy-preserving machine learning, or privacy-preserving analytics. So that's an interdisciplinary thing already, right? So these, these kind of things happen quite a lot. You can also go across the schools, or even colleges. So, uh, Li Fang, may I ask, for the final year projects, do you also allow students to pick a supervisor outside the school or the college? Actually, uh, as far as that, this cross-school FIP project, we do allow. So, it means that um, our SCSE supervisors is still the main supervisor, but the student can get the co-supervisor from other school. Right. Thank you. So there is an option, right? So at least a co-supervision is possible. Yes, yes, it's possible. Very nice. So they can maybe try out that. Uh, Hong Lai, how about um, the industry connections? So I see there is a lot of our industry ecosystem out here, a lot of labs that we have on campus and all. Do you see students working closely with the research labs as well? Um, yes. Uh, in fact, I have some FYP students uh, with me that uh, works on with the um, one of the Singtel um, scale um, research projects that we have. It's essentially about um, how to actually detect um, patients with dementia and uh, how to intervene um, when they get lost and how to actually recover them. So yeah, uh, there are definitely many, many um, such research projects around which uh, we actually enroll the FYP students to uh, participate in. That's great. I think I know that project because I believe you would know that as well. It's either on our social media right now or will come up by next week. Take a look at that project which your student did, uh, tracking and uh, getting, getting to care for your uh, elderly who have dementia. Right, so yeah, that's a, that's a great one. Okay, um, complete U-turn from all our discussions on courses and things. I guess a very standard, straight question. I guess, who should I ask? Prof Soon, maybe? Somebody asked that if my rank point the results just came out. So rank point is borderline. Would I get called for interview, or am I straight away rejected? OK. Uh, we have this attitude-based admission. That means for those students who meet the minimum kind of academic standards and demonstrate capabilities in um, various ways, uh, we will do consider them. Right? So um, do apply, and the, you might be get shortlisted into it for the admission. Okay, so it's worth applying, and then you may be considered for scholarship, or sorry, for the interviews yes, at least. Yes. Prof. Nick, do you want to add to that? 
How is the admission criteria? Is it very strict for the IGPs? How does it go? Okay, so I think uh, basically we do consider people they are on the borderline, right? Uh, based on, for example, the patients in this area, if they demonstrate that they have uh, actually have a lot of uh, uh, interest, they have done project in in this in a related computing related uh, area or taking part in a hackathon or, or something. Yeah, we do consider. So it's not, we, we don't just look at the result directly, actually, right? So of course, you still need to meet the minimum uh, requirements like the mathematics, the H2 mathematics. So if you've done that, then uh, I think you can actually, uh, it, it, we will consider, yeah. yeah. So so even the cutoff point for every year is different from, I mean, it, it depends on the number of students applying, right? Yeah. On the competition that year. That's right, right. yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So, Prof. Nick, it's just a question I got. I'm a little curious. So, data science and AI, it says the IGP GPA is not stated on the document online. I'm not sure. What is the IGP for DSAI in general? Actually, uh, I believe it's stated now. The reason we didn't state it is, uh, there, there are two reasons. Uh, first, this DSAI is a relatively new uh, uh, pro program. So, we only started it uh, three years ago. So, the first batch is quite small. So it's, we feel that it's not a, a good representative of the, uh, the, cut, the, the IGP for, for, for general application. But in recent years, the number have increased. I believe that it was listed last year for the last year cohort. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, so should it, should be be on on our, it should be on our website. You go to okay. NTU website. It, it is, it's there. I'm very sure it's there. All right. Yeah. So do visit our website, the school's website, scsc.ntu.au.sg. Go there. You should, be, you should be able to find it this time. All right, um, Prasun, another question on the admissions. You mentioned about the requirements being already posted, but somebody asked me, um, what are the chances of a JC graduate applying for computer engineering or computer science without physics A or O level background? Uh, okay, so for computer science, uh, we do not require physics backgrounds, but for computer engineering, we do require physics backgrounds. And because computer engineering is theory based more on hardware, uh, more right, so we do require uh, uh, like O level physics or equivalent as the requirements. So this is basically a hard requirement, yeah. But for computer science, uh, we do not assume uh, or do, we do not require physics. Okay, okay, that makes sense. That's okay, good. So you should find the criteria, and then those are the criteria as Prasun just said. Find it out and see if it matches your profile. Okay, so um, maybe let's see what questions to take. Slido, not so many yet. Where are you guys? Post questions on Slido. We are here to answer you. I got one question, but it's definitely above my pay grade. I'll just forward it to the panel, whoever wants to answer. The projected intake for CS and CE this time is about 750, 800. Last time was 523, and then it's growing very, very fast. So would there be an oversupply of computer scientists? And how do you match the faculty to student ratio? Are you aggressively recruiting? Okay, in terms of uh, the numbers, uh, I think uh, we are very careful in uh, our meetings, the, the student, in terms of uh, numbers. We need to make sure that our student actually uh, will find a job, right, at the end, right? So basically, the numbers that we are using is sort of projected by the uh, government, right? What is the demand in the industry? So if you have uh, read out the latest uh, finding from the government, we are still lack of uh, 30, 40,000 a year of uh, <laughs> uh, computer science, computer engineering, or co what we call the IDT sector. Yeah. So the demand will be there. And uh, if you also take note of this recently, a lot of the high tech company, they actually shift the, the main office to Singapore. Right? So the demand for our IT-related uh, uh, you know, trained engineer and scientists will, will be there for, for the, at least for the next 10 years, I would say, right? And, but if you think about uh, how things is going now, you find everything in this world now is uh, more or less associated with uh, computing in one way or the other. Right? So basically, yeah, so this as you also saw in the uh, survey that was shown this just now, one of the slides, Right, so among the, the COVID-19 situations, if you look at that slide again, you'll find that actually this, uh, our computi computing is the only area 
whereby the demands didn't really drop. And in fact, the, the, the mean salary actually increased even during the COVID. So this is uh, it, it's just the right time at the moment, right? So the way we see it, you know, with the AIs in data science, I think this computing area will not be uh, well, just, just a trap and then just go away. It, it, might, it might evolve into something else, but you still need to have this uh, computing background, I think. Sure. Right? Yeah. So uh, Lifang, may I ask you, so where do our students go after graduating most of the time? What are the employment options for CS or CE? Actually, I can see that they cover the whole island. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's all kinds of jobs yes, that they get, yes. right? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, Holai, may I ask you, so a lot of students tell us that, well, if you're CS, you will end up in software engineering or like software development. If you're CE, I'm confused, more hardware, more embedded systems. What does the industry look like? I mean, where do they end up? Okay, um, back to the same, um, you know, same point again. Uh, where is it CS or CE? Basically, is the experience and the, um, and the curriculum that they took in the, uh, the program. Okay, so our program, yeah, CE, I mentioned just now that it does uh, involve more hardware, um, microprocessors, um, sensors. But uh, you'll find that, you know, towards their senior years, the specialization doesn't exclude them from all the, uh, the, the hot uh, trend in, in, in current, um, you know, current work which is basically um, AI, data science, and security. So they could actually specialize in each of these domains. And I would say, um, you know, the, the, the jobs that, uh, is, that is available to CS or CE really um, uh, is not that uh, big of a difference. They are actually everywhere, like what uh, Lifang said. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. Prof. yeah, maybe I can just add to that. I just happen to have my students who are uh, CE student. Well, uh, actually, uh, she's uh, actually working on the, you know, the latest uh, you know, trait, which is a smart vehicle, <laughs> right? Smart car. So there's a lot of demands for actually a CE student in this area, whereby you need to understand hardware in order to implement your uh, smart, your AI, right? So these are the area that is very important. And uh, in fact, if you think about it, uh, why, why is AI and data science become so popular in the, uh, in the recent year? That one of the very important reasons is nowadays we have the hardware that is uh, powerful enough for us to do this very complicated AI and data science analysis, right? So you probably heard that there is a, uh, a shortage of chip at the moment, I see, right? So if you, if you think about it, who is the person that actually uh, work on this uh, IC design, the TSMC, you know? That, so actually it's a computer engineer. So a computer engineer is, is sort of uh, in actually, yeah, it's actually is in great demand. It's just that you know, usually we don't see it like you know the other more more obvious type of uh, in kind of business or something. But there's a great demand for this. Yeah. Okay, maybe I just add on a bit. Sure. Um, I have one previous student, CE. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the say he came back and he told me, well, um, I went for this interview, and once they go through my portfolios and realize that I actually has experience in both embedded systems and cybersecurity, he was signed on the spot. Wow. So there you go. If you're, if you're concerned about what you're going to take up, and if you're planning, say, what your specialization is gonna look like in four years, then as everyone said, it's four years down the line. Think about it after you join. You can always pick and choose courses, take electives in the right track, and you can always specialize in something that you want, all right? So that's, that's always possible. Uh, what about the flip side of the story? So uh, Kelly, if I may ask you, if there are students who are more interested in going for uh, higher studies, say masters or PhD, um, do we offer them guidance? How do the courses prepare them for that? Um, yeah, we, uh, we equip them with some uh, basic theoretical uh, training. And then in the um, uh, year, year three, year four, we actually offer a lot of advanced topics in various domains, including advanced um, uh, net computer networks, advanced topics in algorithms, uh, data mining and data analytics, machine learning, etc. So students can get a sense on which area they would like to step into, and also they could also uh, they could choose uh, more research oriented uh, final year projects to work on. Um, then uh, they could 
get a basic sense on what research is about, uh, its uh, its main uh, workflow, and then whether they really uh, they are really interested in stepping into the uh, high higher study high high level study. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, talking about that, then I, I just remember that there's in, in NTU we have this uh, CN Young program, right? So in the CN Young program, what happened is a student actually take the main discipline, but then they will, in, in this program, they actually take out more uh, science-based uh, courses. So the student under the CN Young program is sort of trained to uh, become more research-oriented, and uh, eventually if they want to do a higher degree, for example, in a uh, Typically, PhD. This will be a good track to follow, actually. Yeah. Right. So, CN Young take up the projects in the first year. I understand. First year, second semester, around that. Eureka, you mentioned, would be second year, first semester, and then FIP slightly later. That's uh, at the end of it, right? So, they have a chance to switch. Can they do all of them, or CNY is focused, and then Eureka and FIP? Some student can continue that. So can someone go from Eureka into FIP, do the same project throughout, Rob? Uh, <coughs> yes, Eureka, you, you actually can do multiple rounds with Eureka, right? Do two Eurekas, and eventually you can continue with the FIP. So if you are kind of uh, um, interested in this particular area and has built up or want to fully utilize the experience you have gained in the early Eureka program, you can just continue, yeah, provided you are being invited again. <laughs> Yeah, it's something called uh, Eureka FYP, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, we do encourage continuous work. So besides Eureka, there's another program is innovation program. So we do have FIP innovation. So it means that the student can continue from the innovation program to their FIP. Oh, wow. That's mm -hmm. really good. But in a part, just not just the innovation program, but Honglai, if I'm not wrong, we also have an innovation lab which allows or rather fosters students' involvement in entrepreneurial efforts, right? Yeah, there is actually some, uh, some scheme and programs that allow some students, the more entrepreneur one, to actually um, um, if, you know, propose, uh, do some proposals. And if the school actually accepts it, they are given some grants to actually uh, proceed with their proposal. Very nice. Okay. All right. So um, we have a few Slido questions. Maybe this, uh, this is a good question to take up, I guess. It's open for the entire panel. We all teach classes. Somebody asked, how are the courses like? Is it like a small group with the faculty? A huge group you were just teaching? What is the, what is the ambience? How are your courses? Maybe Prof Nick, the courses Yeah, maybe I can uh, answer this in, uh, in the general way first. Uh, uh, I think just now, one of the question is, uh, what is the size of our you know, intake, right? It's quite yeah. big nowadays. So how do we actually ensure that uh, you know, everybody have a chance to interact with the professor, for example? So the way that we are running our courses nowadays is uh, for the lecture, right, we mostly conduct online at the moment due to the COVID-19 situation, right? We uh, actually is uh, more than just conduct online. We actually uh, prepare the you know, material and then we record it Right, we make it into what we call a lamb sequence, whereby you know there are actually knowledge check question along the way that the student need to actually you know try out when they are watching the video. So our year one and year two courses nowadays is uh, we usually have this pre-prepared uh, video that accompany the lectures, right? So, but more importantly, we always have tutorials and uh, almost have labs in every year one, year two courses. So in the tutorial and labs, you are break into small group of uh, usually not more than 30, right? So you have a chance to actually uh, you know, face to come face to face to meet with your uh, the, the instructor, right? And in the labs, you actually uh, also work in, uh, in, uh, in our labs, which is about a size of about 35 maximum. So you actually have the hands-on, okay, you have an instructor there. So yes, our number is big, but we always ensure that you have the chance to actually meet our professor, our instructor, and uh, meet your fellow student. So that's how we conduct the course in general. Yeah, maybe uh, that's I think I'll might start with Li Fang, maybe. Li Fang, let's start with the first year. First year, first semester, your course 1103. How does it run? Um, as for the 1103, because our intake is about 800 plus. 
So um, during the COVID-19 period, definitely we can't have the physical lecture. So we have the Teams live event lecture besides the pre-recorded um, videos. Now after that, we break the student into 25 groups or more than 25 groups. We have the tutorial, we have the lab, the practical exercise. So the student will go to the physical lab to have their tutorial in the lab. Um, and they do have the interactive uh, session with the academic staff and with the TAs. So we do have the strong team to support their learning journey. Great. Thank you. Great. So for my experience, first year, second semester, I follow up from Li Fang's course in Python. And then I do a data science and AI course. So that's also similar. You do a LAMP sequence online videos. You come to the class for hands-on programming. And also in another one for the DSAI program, the lab is now our AMD sponsored lab, which is in a slightly different format. So we do small challenges, like team-based challenges in the class. So it's way more hands-on in general, okay? So I meet with you in person, small groups. Um, may I go to maybe year two? Kelly, how does a big course like algorithms run? Uh, I think it's in a similar mode. Uh, basically, for algorithm design and analysis, we have pre-recorded uh, uh, video lectures. And then uh, we also have one hour review lecture every week to quickly review the lecture contents in that particular week. And then uh, for the Q&A discussion, and then also we will have some uh, on-site exercise for the students to practice. Then we also divide them into small um, uh, tutorial and the lab groups. And uh, for tutorial, we, we basically do some, uh, again, more exercise on the, uh, on the contents we have delivered. Uh, for labs, we, we design some uh, you know, interesting uh, group projects, and then students will form small group, like uh, um, two to three students, and then they will work on some real uh, programs. So, so for the graph part, we basically like uh, uh, use some real graph data from Facebook, Twitter, those social networks, and then let the students to have the experience of um, handling such large-scale large data, and then what would be the real challenges in, in uh, practical programs. Right. I've been in one of your labs, the algorithms lab, and the students did amazing. I mean, they, they really go through the data really, really well. They know what they're doing. Uh, how like, may I ask you, how does a second or third year level hardware course look like for the CE? Okay, um, just talk about my course. Um, sure. The mode of delivery is very similar to what Nick and Kelly has mentioned. It's split into um, first information delivery, pre-recorded videos, and after that, um, we have live um, review sessions with them to answer any of their queries, and also to review some of the uh, more important and more complex topics. Then um, they have tutorials, which where we have split into smaller groups so that they have more attention. And there's tutorials more onto the um, concepts, um, applications, and the theory portion. And then that's where we come to the lab. Okay. Um, my module actually focuses a lot on the lab side because um, really um, computing is a subject where you need to do it, then you will appreciate it. So uh, they are put through five labs. Um, the labs are incremental, that means that everything, everyone is related. And at the end of the, five, um, the, the fifth lab, they are supposed to actually come up with some deliverables based on what they have learned for the past four labs. Makes sense. Great. Thank you. So I think we should finish with maybe Prof. Sun teaching a technical elective in year four, year, four. year three, four. <coughs> yes. How does it go? So year four, you come to the specialized uh, courses, right? More advanced topics. So in year four, typically, uh, we do not distinguish the lecture and tutorial that much. So it's conducted in a similar format. So for my particular course, I conduct uh, uh, through Teams. So I don't have a pre-recorded videos, but we do Teams live. Uh, for that purpose, I create a channel. So all the students are actually put in this channel. And they can ask questions in this channel, and they can chat through this channel as well. And the channel is there for 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. Right. Wow. So, okay, yeah. um, so I I'll also chip in to answer some questions in this channel. So basically, it's a it's a it's a kind of group uh, uh, study, right? Um, then for the assignments, it's group based assignments. So the students need to uh, work on a project in a group of four or five, and they also 
uh, required to uh, record video, and then everyone can watch the other's uh, attendant performance. Okay, great. So I think um, maybe just outside the classes also, how do the students interact? Maybe Honglai, do you get feedback from students? Do they make friends with only their groups, CS with CS, DSAI with DSAI, or it's more diverse? Um, I would say it's really student dependent. Some prefer to keep their own group, and uh, from the from, from the discussions with students and the, um, and their feedback, um, the orientation program actually uh, is one of the uh, the main um, places where they form very close cliques, and this actually brings them through um, until even after they graduate. Okay, that's one part. The other the other clique that you typically form is in the hall. Okay, they are hall mates and all those. And uh, the last one, of course, is the um, the CCAs and the clubs that they join. So it, it really depends on um, which the students where are they most active in, and then that's where their grouping might be uh, there. Right. I think we always say this that the hall life offers you a way to learn how to be independent, and we have plenty of ways to support you on campus. But your friends will always be your friends. So make friends on campus and then share with them. Talk to them, and that group will last forever. OK, so coming up from that, uh, we have a few specific questions on Slido on our admission procedures. We should answer them before we close. So um, quick checks, what is the difference between DSAI and the new MSCS, Mathematical and Computer Sciences program? Sofnik, if I may ask you. The DSAI and the Mathematical Science? Mac Mac the Max, the MSCS, Mathematical and Computer Sciences with SPMS. Okay, so uh, basically in computer science, as you have heard, we actually have the AI and data science as a specializations. So basically, uh, the DSAI is sort of a, a, a sub-branch of our computer science focusing on AI and data science. On the other hand, the mathematical and computer science is for those who are strong in mathematics or interested in mathematics, but they also want to see how mathematics can be applied in a computing uh, domain, right? So it's actually quite different. One is data science and AI. One is uh, more computing, computer science in, in a more general way, but uh, uh, realized on a theoretical mathematics. Yeah. So, so they are quite different. So they're different, right? Yeah. So quite different. So maybe from an industry point of view, maybe Hong Lai, if you would like to answer, it's a similar question though, that the computer science is a degree that we offer, but there are also universities offering information sciences. What would you say the big difference would be between those two? Okay, um, information science, I mean, I'm just answering from what, as far as I know, yeah. okay? Um, that is more related to information technology management. That used to be one of our specialization. Um, it is still one of the mainstay in the industries. Um, people like IBM, HP, so these are still taking in all these people. But um, from the trend that uh, the computing industry is actually moving, and then that's why we actually tailored um, our specialization according to the trend. And that seems to be going uh, towards like what we mentioned just now, the three main uh, domains, um, IA, yeah, sorry, AI, yeah. and uh, data science, and the uh, security. But um, again, um, that, that, that is also why, um, how we actually structured our curriculum. Uh, we are actually quite enabled in the sense that we will monitor what is the industry trend at that point in time, and we would um, make adjustment to uh, all these specialization domains uh, as and when it's required. Right. So um, in terms of our admission, so Prof. Sunil mentioned there would might be interviews for the students. So somebody asked, would there be interviews for double degree programs like business and computing? And then who conducts the interview? For double degree business computing, the interview will be conducted by ABS, the NIB University. I see. Is it the same for all our double degree programs? So for econ, if there is something, will it be? Okay. Um, so because it's double degree, right? Uh, so the student need to meet the requirements of both sides, right? right? I just use an example of the double degree with business. So the student need to meet the requirement from all side and meet the requirement from the business side. So from the business side, they have the minimum requirement on English. Uh, so if the student is like borderline in terms of English results, and they will take an interview. Uh, in this case, right? So is um, so this uh, I believe the same applies to other double degrees. So they need to meet the requirement for both sides. Right. So is it is it possible? So somebody earlier asked as well that if we don't have physics, 
then you said C S is okay, but C E not. If they want to come into C E, do they have an option of an interview or a test they can pass, or it's not possible at all? Okay, no problem. <laughs> I can. Okay. What you are saying is, if they don't have any physics, physics background, but still want to join computer join engineering, uh, uh, currently it's not possible. Okay. So they they must have a physics in uh, in a certain uh, you know in the study. Uh, it, it, this is just like, for example, if you don't have uh, H2 maths, we will not be able to accept you into the computing. Yeah. Understood. So th this is the basic key requirement. Key requisite. Yeah. So, uh, Prof, may I continue from that? So, that's a pre-requirement. Suppose they come in, suppose like a double degree program, and they find out the load is too much. Can they drop down to one of the degrees? Can they go for a double major? What are the routes? Yes, they can actually, uh, you know, uh, change to a single degree program, for example. So they can uh, drop the business or drop the computing, right? So yes, there are students who did that, although not so common, right? so it's possible. Yeah. Understood. So, but they cannot go for a double major at that point because that's a different degree, I understand. That's right, double major is, uh, uh, is actually, uh, uh, how, how do I say? Double major is actually allocated during admission. Right, so so we we cannot like allow the student to change to a double major, but they can Once drop they in, but they can drop to uh, just a single degree program. A yeah. single, but they can take out the business as a minor, for example, if they drop the the, the business program. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Okay, yes, just, yes. Uh, just to add on, uh, this is because of the curriculum and timetable design. All right, so after let's see, you have went through two years. Uh, so if you if a double if the second uh, the second major program and they have studied uh, some right. kind of uh, subjects right. and right. you are studying the double degree and once you drop that uh, it's it's not that easy to catch up but right. because double degree uh, you can drop the easier one to become a single degree um, but as Prof Nick mentioned it's very uncommon all right mm -hmm. the reason is that we keep a fairly high standard for those who come in uh, with double degree all right. So this is also provided, I say, uh, 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 a consideration for the students to consider when they uh, put in the choices, right? So try to try not to put the double degree at the end of the choices because the requirement is a bit higher than the single degree. So uh, I do see some students should put, let's say, computer science at the first choice, but double degree at the fifth choice. Uh, in this case, you, you don't have the chance to come to fifth choice because the requirement actually is higher, right? So because you put the Computer science as first choice, then of course you will be accepted in right. that program yeah. because you are, it's a, your first choice. That's a good strategy. So see, that's a good strategy to optimize those five choices that you can make, all right? So think about that. All right, um, maybe a last question from Slido. Oh, this is good. So with this current situation of COVID, maybe Prof Nick is best to answer that. Do you think that the cohort size will increase a lot? What are we looking at? Okay, um, as we say, we are sort of, um, okay, I mean, NTU is, we are trying to, you know, help the government in a way, right? So we actually uh, have been allocated certain numbers of students for this program. But based on our experience last year, so when the COVID-19 actually uh, you know, happens, we are actually asked to increase our intake, right? because a lot of students are not able to actually go overseas to take out the program. So we actually increased the, the intakes to, uh, you know, to, to absorb those uh, you know, extra candidates. Yeah. So I think depending on the situation, right, we, 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 might, we, we might increase it you know, if it's, there's a demand for us to do that. Yeah. So in line with that, this may be some question that people will ask if they're applying from other countries. Will that also affect our international intake? Will it go up or down for that? Okay, uh, actually we are keeping our international student intake in proportion, at a certain proportion to our, you know, our, our total intake, right? So we will not just certainly increase, right, then by another 50%. So if there's an increase in the total number, Right, then there will be a corresponding increase in the international student uh, intake. Yeah. Okay, so we are almost at the end. We got a number of Slido questions. 
thank you so much for interacting with us. Uh, we hope we have answered most of your queries. If you have some targeted queries, post it in our Reddit Ask Me Anything channels or also wait for the student panel in the afternoon. They will give you some personal feedback from their own experiences. Before we end, I would like our panelists to maybe say a few words to end. Any order, maybe Prof. Sun and then others. Okay, so um, this is a, a good time that you think and choose from different uh, programs. I do advise that you just um, read more about the programs that you're interested in and look at the curriculums and understand what exactly each program is about and make your choices, all right? And also do look at the indicator points and as a reference, right? Because it does not reflect the current year's, uh, in current year's uh, uh, cutoff points because it's based on the number of application, but that serves as a good reference. Okay. Right, right. Thank you. Kelly? I think this is a good time for uh, the computing domain because uh, there is a really a, a, a great demand in the talents in uh, data science, uh, AI, and also uh, computer engine engineer. So um, come and join us. Uh, do apply. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Nick. Yeah, just to add to that, I think uh, computing has become something like uh, uh, essential skill that you need to have now you know, in the industry, no matter which, which, which uh, area you go to. So I think this is the uh, right time to actually uh, consider this, right? And of course, you probably also want to look at the campus life, university, everything, right? So do explore this, look through our videos, uh, write to us, and then we will try to help you as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Pravnik. Sifa? SCSE welcomes you. We are looking forward to seeing you in our school. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Honglai, something from the student's perspective or no? Your own. <laughs> the, you know, the good thing about the last one is that all the points have been mentioned. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, you know, like what um, the, the profs have mentioned, okay, talk to more people, do more research. Uh, because choosing uh, universities and a program is a very important milestone in our life. And uh, all the best. Thank you so much. All right. It was lovely to be with you. Thanks a lot for joining. And as you heard the panel, please start planning, talk to the students, and see how things are going. All right? Okay. So before we end, that's your motto. Learn to be independent. All right? And that's what we are going to help you with. Take a quick look at a teaser on our campus prepared by our students. And then you can look for more on our social media channels. There you go. <laughs>